The United States of America and the Republic for the Stance, We are going to move forward right with our report. So if we can have our representative come up and talk about spirit week. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our leaders in our Intermediate School Student Council. Uh, Mrs. Busnick is our school counselor and also one of our student council advisors. Mrs. Brunswick uh, is the other advisor. She would have been here tonight. Unfortunately, she had a death in the family, so she was not able to be here. Um, but it's my pleasure. We have uh, some great leaders, McKenna Breen, Brody Crandall, Eli Martinez, and Lennon Zabelli. They are going to give you a little presentation about what we did for Spirit Homecoming Spirit Week this year. Thank you, Mr. Haskins. Our Intermediate School Student Council provides our students a voice. We also model our three tenets of respect, responsibility, and kindness, and provide support for the programs of interest and value to our students. It is my pleasure working with this great group of kids every day. I would like to thank Mrs. Brunswick, like Mr. Haskins said, who is not able to be with us um, today, uh, this evening, excuse me. Um, she created this slideshow that showcases um, our activities for our homecoming week. September 20th through 24th, we supported the junior senior high school by participating in our homecoming week. We love to show our unity and pride. On Monday, we all dressed like tourists. We wore, we wore vacation clothes and dreamed of our favorite spot to relax. Tuesday, we encouraged everyone to cheer for their favorite team by wearing four gear. Black and Heart Wednesday speaks for itself. Thursday, we showed our school spirit with throwbacks off. Say hello again to the 60s, 70s, and 80s. I wasn't even born yet. <laughs> right in Spirit Day, let us show our Spartan spirit. We are truly a Spartan nation.
I'm Joshua Roska. I'm the 10th grade student council president. And I'm just seeing this Simeon, our vice president. Um, a few weeks ago, we did a spirit week for the pep rally that was supposed to happen. It was canceled twice. Uh, we did a lot of days like where purple and gold, and also we did a whiteout. And of course, the bonfire was canceled as well. Uh, for upcoming spirit week, we're doing a Halloween theme one at the end of October. That'll include a blackout. And later in uh, November, we'll be doing American Red Cross Blood Drive. And then um, near that time, we will also be doing a Together We Can Food Drive. We'll be working with the local food bank. Uh, we are planning future activity nights. It'll hopefully work with in service day, try and get more people to help with that. Uh, we'll also be supporting senior projects and class level fundraisers. We'd like to thank the board, Mr. Allen, Dr. Peets, and our student council advisors. Thank you for your time. Certainly not a, a typical year for for Spirit Week, as Josh had said. You know, our, our bonfire uh, pep rally has been canceled twice. The first time was uh, was just due to the rise in COVID cases. And yesterday, we were planning on um, a rescheduled outdoor pep rally and bonfire tomorrow, but the weather's not supposed to be that great. So just now, because we were going to do an outdoor pep rally just to make sure we met all the COVID guidelines outside. But because of the weather, uh, it was best to cancel it. And, uh, Mr. Allen and uh, Senior Council are looking at maybe doing some kind of a winter event, which uh, they, should, they should be a lot of fun for the kids. So. Great. Okay, we call up. Uh, <coughs> this is Ryan Mr. Um, Mr. So um, we're going to take a few moments this evening to share with you the work uh, so many of our teachers and staff participated in uh, this summer. A lot of times people ask teachers, what do you do over the summer? And they are very busy. We do a lot and we want to share with you what we do, but we don't want to take too long for this time because we're going to move through things at a fairly good pace. And if you need, just stop us and we'll go more into it. But um, the first slide, if I could show that. There were three major curriculum projects that we worked on this summer. I'm going to have um, Danelle show you the 712 ELA research link here for just a moment. Oh, this is not the right one. There we go. This is called the Stripling Model of Inquiry. This is recommended by our regional librarian uh, to use in our region as a common language to help kids uh, uh, research. Kids don't generally love researching, so we thought if we had a, a, a common language on how to do it, kids would become more familiar with it, and it wouldn't seem so intimidating. And it also, using this model, allows us to build from grade levels. So you'll see, starting in seventh grade, we've started to uh, define what investigate looks like. We started to define what construct looks like, express, reflect, connect, and wonder. And then, Darnell, if you would just kind of like a one second pace go through all of them, go 9, 10, 11, 12. And so you can see progressively research skills as kids go through the system will get stronger because teachers will increase the rigor. So, our ELA department worked on that this summer. In our elementary school, we've been working on um, updating our journeys unit to have a, um, a more local curriculum feel to it. We're also um, you know, introducing additional texts and poetry and nonfiction. So this is just an example 
Uh, we can see the next generation's uh, ELA standards are along the top. And then it's just a, the agreed upon skills, strategies, products and phonemic awareness work, sight words, and just so forth. So we know what's going on in our classrooms, and teachers can have uh, some common, kids have common experiences across the classrooms. The teachers can still select, uh, you know, a poem or a short story that their kids might like. And then the third one, we spent a lot of time working on sight and high frequency words. What we noticed, the high frequency words don't change from year to year, but the order in which we teach them is really important because in order to, to progress in um, the Fountas and Canal levels, if kids don't have certain sight words at certain times, they're not gonna pass that level. So we went through with teachers this summer and really detailed what words kids need to know to be able to pass that uh, benchmark assessment if they're appropriate time to do that. So this is just an example of one of the sheets we made. And uh, now we can go on to the next slide. The other piece of curriculum work that um, we do is teachers can write a proposal. And we get a whole um, a bunch of proposals that are reviewed by teachers um, and a few administrators. And we approve ours for the work that teachers want to do. I will not go into what each of these um, uh, examples are, but this is some of the work that teachers engaged in. A lot of times departments did this work together. We aligned some of the 7 12 cur library curriculum. We uh, created differentiated resources for some of our elementary curriculum. We updated our science pacing guides. We strengthened writing across the content areas. We integrated STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math into some of our um, uh, elementary curriculum. We aligned our social studies assessments to new regions exams. We revised our food science curriculum, and we aligned math curriculum to the next generation standards. And I will turn it over to Mrs. Lynn. Hello, I'm a little shorter than Dr. Eves. So this summer, I worked quite a bit, actually, um, participating and facilitating various trainings for our staff. The first one that I did in the summer was six plus one traits of writing. One of the, thing that, the things that we've noticed over time is that with the state assessment and writing to a prompt and a task all the time, We've lost a little bit of the sight of those things that we know are just good writing practices. So six plus one traits of writing is really about teaching the characteristics of what makes great writing. Things like the ideas, the organization, our word choice, our voice. And so I had a group of teachers, about eight, uh, who participated over three weeks time. And it was a really intensive five hours each one of those three, um, three days during the three weeks. And I actually have had the great pleasure and privilege of working um, just this past week. I started working in a fourth grade classroom to help model lessons. I'm going into another fourth grade classroom next week. And the writing that the kids did in this past week, we started with the ideas trait. It was really incredible. And just the life that the kids had in writing, not feeling like, oh, I checked off that bullet. Okay, it wasn't like that. So I think we're going to see a real benefit to, throughout our school again. Actually, Heather and I were talking about how do we make that more widespread within the district. I also did two weeks worth of two hour sessions over those two weeks. I would do two hours and then two hours, and then the following week, a two hour session and another two hour session. And those little mini sessions were on formative assessment. We're very, very good at doing formative assessment and also summative assessment. But we tend to focus a lot on summative assessment. And I really wanted to provide training. And I had almost 20 people at all of these. And in the formative assessment, it's that idea of we need to use warm-ups. We need to be observing kids and taking anecdotal records. We need to be giving exit tickets and little short mini quizzes to get an idea and a gauge of where our kids are on a daily basis. So that was very well attended, and hopefully we'll see more of that in classrooms. I did a training on feedback, really giving kids specific feedback as opposed to that good job, great work, but what is it that they truly did well, or do they need to make some growth in? I also did a, a two-hour session on Think Alouds and Teacher Talk. There's a great study through Harvard that talks about just teachers and any staff, quite honestly, elevating the way that we speak to kids. Just using more sophisticated words and language actually increases achievement exponentially, quite a bit. So I did a two-hour session on how to model that in our classrooms. 
And then I did a two hour session on engagement, part, partici engagement and participation techniques, just getting kids to be a more active um, role in the classroom. And then after that, I did a three day training from eight to three um, for a new teacher and Tim Patton was also uh, did a part of that work and he'll talk about that in a moment. But over those three days, it was really an opportunity for me to or get a, give an orientation to our new teachers about what makes soda so great, how do we function as a school, and also our community. We took our new teachers out to lunch at the Soda State Heights. We took them on a bus tour, a field trip through the town so they could see all of the different uh, parts of Soda and what makes us such a diverse and wonderful place to live and to work. And then Tim's going to go on to the next part. We also did digital digital. So technology obviously has played a key role in uh, school, especially over the last couple of years, as we've increased the number of Chromebooks. Um, so one of my favorite trainings I get to do is the uh, digital days, and that kind of caps our summer. We always do this uh, towards the end of August, where we, we do a lot of focused um, technology-related pieces and how they can be used in the classroom. Over the last couple of years, the focus was all these new programs that we were implementing and helping teachers get up to speed on how to use those programs. This summer, the focus shifted a little bit and it moved from um, learning about the programs and how can we better implement those in a personalized learning as well as a blended learning uh, adaptation into classrooms. So um, over those two days, um, we met from eight to one each day and we kind of modeled it where uh, the beginning piece was a whole group instructional piece where Brenda and I did a whole group piece. Then we moved into some smaller group where teachers had some choices on what mini workshops that they wanted to do. And then we ended each day with some facilitated planning time where teachers could utilize that time to meet with Brenda and I, um, learn more about how they could implement the different pieces that they learned. And it was pretty well attended. Um, we had well over 20 participants each day. Teachers had the choice to come for one day, two days, um, either that it was a Monday or a Tuesday, so they could come to either Monday or Tuesday or come to both days. And we had a lot of people that ended up coming to both days. So I was pretty pleased with that. As Brenda said, um, I helped with new teacher orientation this year. We added a lot, as I mentioned, programs to our, uh, our, our district. And with around 18 to 20 new teachers, um, I spent two hours each day kind of teaching them how to utilize all these different programs, making sure that they could get logged in, making sure that all of their accounts were set up and correct, and they could begin to navigate. And then as we go through um, the school year, my focus has been to help support them as they get into the, the real classroom setting using those programs. So it's kind of a nice way to end the summer and introduce people into the school year and really have that technology focus be throughout the summer. Other questions? So I know it's pretty new in the school year so far, you know, um, but with the new teachers that went through that orientation, have you seen them and observed them working with those programs that you guys taught and showed them and modeled for them? So um, I actually have 20 new teachers and I have observed every single one of them already once in the classroom. So yes, I see a variety of things. Sometimes it's including some of the technology. Other times it's about strategies that they learned from doing different summer work. It isn't always digital technology. So the good news is they're using the things that we have in place. I've also had, I do monthly new teacher meetings and I've already had my first one of those as well with our new teachers. We have the largest crop of new teachers since I started as staff developer. So it's going to be a lot of work and we just hired one new one and we have two more and then another one after Christmas. So it's going to be a very busy year, but I'm happy to say I've observed all of them and had post-observation meetings with every single one that we've hired so far. And from a, a program perspective, yeah, if there are a number of new teachers that have already set up like a weekly meeting with me to go through technology to make sure they're feeling supported. Um, and a lot of it now is I'll get an email from a teacher wanting to set up time with me to go over one of the programs. Because, I mean, six hours over a three-day period, it, it, it's a lot of time. And uh, it, it can be kind of that it's so much information all at once. So we kind of broke it out by day for, to help teachers that way, but also with now to help support them as the school gets started. So hopefully we're more tech savvy than I am. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay.
Any other questions? Heather, what was your footnote? Your footnote is up there. I have to give Brenda credit. <laughs> <laughs> I opened it up and I was like, wait, where did this come from? <laughs> So in our elementary school, um, and I think everyone is well aware, we are working on uh, very focused on literacy, and uh, we're going to just reflect a little bit on where we've been. I'm going to talk a little bit about where we're going, and we have um, Suzanne and Kate from RPC here with us today. They've been helping to support this work. Um, uh, they came to us and had a wanted to help us with some professional development, and uh, they asked where we wanted our focus, and we said literacy, particularly at the UPK and K and one grades, because we know that that's where we'll have our biggest impact. So they're going to share a little bit about their work also. So, so just to, just to recap, uh, for the board and for the audience, so obviously, with COVID, uh, some learning gaps were created uh, because of physically not being in school and learning virtually. And as we started in September and October, we, you know, and we started collecting data, we really saw some of those, those gaps um, pretty clearly. So starting in January, we made some structural changes to our uh, reading intervention model. The first, well, so prior, the model has always been. We've been very fortunate to have four reading teachers. All four reading teachers were assigned to work with students K through three. So in some instances, what that had created were situations where one reading teacher who's working with four grade levels and the cohorts mixed, one reading teacher could be actually working with 12 to 14 classroom teachers. And which made it almost nearly impossible for them to plan together, to communicate well. So starting in January, without trying to make a big, big schedule change, we restructured it so that two reading teachers were assigned to just two grade levels. So we had teachers assigned to K2 and another two teachers assigned to first and third. And with that, uh, we also worked on uh, uh, common uh, progress monitoring tools and a common communication tool. So even though they were still working with potentially, you know, five or six reading teachers, or I'm sorry, classroom teachers, that's still substantially less, 50 to 60% less than they were before. And that went very well. Uh, another thing that we did was we do collect a lot of data. So we set data review meetings for every six weeks where every uh, every adult that works with a child meets together every six weeks to analyze the data review the data and decide what are our next steps what actions we have to keep in place or change to get the kids to continue to grow and then lastly with the help of Suzanne and Kate, um, we had our uh, pre-kindergarten teachers working very closely with them. And from the pre-K work with RPC, what came out from that work was something that our students really needed to work on was their phonological awareness. How those, what the sounds those letters make. So we piloted a resource called the Henry with pre-K, and it was going extremely well, that about, I don't know, six or eight weeks in, kindergarten heard about what pre-K was doing, and kindergarten hopped on board. Uh, so pre-K and K piloted the Hegarty from, what do you say, about March? About March uh, to the end of the year, and that actually showed some great results. I don't want to steal Heather's thunder because she's going to talk all about, all about uh, 
what uh, happens, uh, what's been happening since then. But Darnell, if you go to so the board, you might remember in one of our data presentations, this was, so I only have the kindergarten slide. This shows where the kindergarten, where we started in the year. So when we presented data in October or November to the board, we didn't have any students in kindergarten reading on grade level. And then when we presented again in February, we presented the January data, we weren't doing much better. Those gaps still exist. And that's really what pushed us to make these structural changes. And you can see from January, when we really started making those changes to June, the growth that we made. So we sat down and talked and planned and really took what we did from January to June and collaborated in, in what could we do to make it even better. So that is what uh, Heather is going to speak to now. Mike, real quick. Yeah. I know we've brought it up before, but how many absences of class do we have? Oh, 18. 18. 10%. I, I couldn't remember. Yeah. All right. So from July to the present, we've really maintained a lot of the work that we started. We spent um, the summer uh, training teachers of some more in the Haggerty, which is a biological awareness um, lesson for people who have kids in the UPK program, kindergarten first. There's a lot of tapping and rhyming that go on with that program. And we've heard lots of kids go home and sing those songs, which is great. Um, we've assigned one literacy special to each grade level. So one of the literacy specialists is a true part of the grade. Um, and that's really helpful because that teacher gets to understand the curriculum deeply, gets to work very closely with those four or five teachers and can really have impact not only when they pull kids out, but also when they're in the classroom, and you know, even sometimes teaching right beside the teacher. Um, we've identified root causes for why students struggle to learn to read and are developing a pathway of change. And what I mean by that is we look at each student in the elementary school and we ask questions. And we do these this at weekly meetings and at team meetings. Um, and if we notice after two weeks, a student isn't making any gains, we see, we evaluate what those supports are, we see what the resources are, is it because students have been absent, are they in the wrong group, what do they need, because we know our kids can learn. So we are tracking data um, really on a weekly basis. Uh, uh, just to give you an example, in the beginning of the school year, we had a student who had, had shown some regression, uh, was a B at the end of the year, was an A when he came in. We immediately made sure he was working with a literacy specialist. He's back up to a B. The same student came in with 28 sight words and that is up to 37 sight words. And our UPK students, we have a high number of UPK students who already know 18 or more about. Um, and that's just a few very small specific details, but that's how closely we're monitoring it because we don't want any student to get, to get lost in this process. We're identifying tier one needs at weekly NCSS data review meetings. Uh, that is where we're looking at where, what classrooms have a high number of high need students. So if, if I'm a teacher and 50% of my kids aren't reading on grade level, it's not that I'm not a good teacher, it's just I have some kids that have some unique needs. So I'm gonna either need to start doing something differently or I need some support. And that's where Kate and Suzanne are gonna talk a little bit about some additional um, ways we are uh, helping to support our struggling reader. We also have a, Sorry. oh, no, we're at, there yet, thanks. We also have that fifth reading teacher who is able to go into the classroom and support the tier one instruction. So if I'm teaching guided reading to my kids, I might need a literacy specialist to stay with me during that instruction to just show me some different ways or to find some teachable moments that maybe I'm not seeing as the teacher because we know the tier one instruction is so very important. 
Uh, we're monitoring all student progress at team leadership MTSS meetings. Uh, we were just at a meeting the other day with a group of teachers, and our whole 40 minutes was just talking about kids. You know, making sure that we understood where every student is um, in that you know in those classrooms. And then we've added a literacy specialist support to our UPK program because once again we know the earlier we can strengthen kids' skills develop kids' skills, the better they're going to be throughout, throughout um, their education here with us. So there's um, Kate and Suzanne uh, talked with us over the summer about the science of reading. Um, and I'm going to let them share a little bit of their knowledge of what is the science of reading and what we're doing with it. So to go along with that great foundation that has been laid by um, the element the admins in the, in the elementary building, we're going to add another layer to that. So over the summer, we got together with your, the administration team and gave them some basic foundations on literacy instruction. Um, and then we developed a plan to work with the literacy specialists at the elementary level and um, build their knowledge around the science of reading. Um, the Science of Reading is a body of scientifically based research about reading. It's not a curriculum, it's not a program. Um, it's research that informs teachers how proficient reading and writing develops. So we know from this work how the brain develops as, as, we learn, as children learn to read. So we're to focus on that, that Science of Reading has demonstrated the instructional methods that are best help to that best help children learn how to read. So with that being said, teachers are working hard and they're doing a great job, but if they know better, they're gonna do better. So we're gonna focus on building their knowledge around instruct literacy instructional practices um, that align with this important research. And it's a commitment that the district has made um, to this plan to support teachers to focus on building their knowledge around the science of reading, which will have a significant impact on students learning to read. So we're going to focus on them knowing better so they can do better. That's the science of reading in a nutshell. And so our, over, our overall goal is to implement and sustain a responsive literacy program that meets the needs of all students and ensures all students are receiving the appropriate instruction and intervention throughout the entire school year. We want our students to be confident, proficient readers, writers, and thinkers. We do not want to be surprised by data. We want to know our data very well so we can be responsive to it. Are there any questions? solving team that meets every other week and we sit down with the teacher the reading specialist anyone who's involved and usually one of the, the pieces that we make sure the, the teacher has done one of the questions we always ask is have you reached out to the parents have you worked with them because sometimes the like sight words for example um, they just need to practice them at home. So we reach out and, you know, clearly talk to the parent about what we're seeing and what they could do at home to help support. So if it's just sight words skill, we will send home the sight words that the kids need to practice, you know, send home instructions, we'll give them all the materials that they need, but we do make sure that the parents are part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
information that anybody has any questions about 4.1, page 2, or page 3. Are we on it? Information? Someone, Arcade, could you bring down the, the board for public participation, please? Go for it. Yes, right. Thank you. Just some reminders about public participation. Our presentation should be your presentation should be, should be as brief as possible and no more than three minutes. Um, you do not get an opportunity to speak during the first public forum. You will be moved to a second public forum. All speakers are asked to conduct themselves in a civil manner, obscene language, um, complex statements advocating racial, religious, or other forms of prejudice or shouting will not be tolerated. And to protect the privacy of individual students, statements concerning personal and confidential student matters are prohibited. During the forum, the president will not reply to comments or questions except by members of the public. Um, the president shall direct members of the public with specific personal complaints to the district's policy regarding public complaints. Okay. So, um, call Melissa Selby. Oh, sorry. Good evening, my name is Melissa Slavey and I live here in SOTUS. First, I would like to say that most of us realize that educators, the facilitators, and those directly involved with the ed education of our children do have good intentions. We also realize that there are forces working against us to federalize education. Many, I'm sure, find themselves between a rock and a hard place when decisions need to be made. However, true, pure, unindoctrinated principles in the education of our children need to be the primary focus. I need to address the matter of the $3.5 million allocated by the federal government for the response to COVID-19 as it pertains to education. I know that the school is awaiting approval of their plan for these funds, and I would like to publicly ask for a copy of that plan submitted. And also if that $3.5 million is for this district alone, or is it spread across Wayne County? Um, usually, the public comment portion of the school board meeting was pushed to the last. Some citizens at the last meeting had to leave before the open comments by the public as they had family to get home to or had other obligations, yet they made the time to be here. Their voices go unheard. We sit and listen for 20 plus minutes to each speaker on their school related topics and I feel that their time should be limited as well. We as a collective did not appreciate the fact that the doctors who spoke at the September 9th board meeting got up and left together before they could hear some valid concerns and facts from the audience. These tactics scream control, the lack of interest and concern. For your answers to these questions, I have left my email below and I look forward to your responses. On the topic of CRT, 
I would like to bring to everyone's attention that in, in a survey done on 691 New York State schools, which was done in 2019, SOTUS ranked 90 for diversity based on racial and economic diversity and survey responses from students and parents. There are reviews posted that students and parents are satisfied and feel comfortable with the school environment, their classmates, and teachers, which I guess leads us to I don't understand the necessity for CRT at all. However, in academics, this school district received a grade of 36% in reading and a 38% in math proficiency. It leads us to the notion that our district is focusing on what is deemed prudent by the federal government instead of basic education, known as the three R's. I invite you to research this website. It's listed here as www.nichenice.com forward slash K-12. In closing, I encourage the community to get more involved. If you are timid of speaking, just show up. Others here will speak for you. We the people have the power to bring about positive change. We outnumber those who have a different agenda. And if you feel that public education is no longer the right choice for your family, pull your kids out. Hit the district where they will surely feel it in their pocketbook. Maybe then they will listen. Thank you. Thank you. AJ Melkoff. Hello. Um, per our last meeting, when you guys brought the doctors in, um, that agree with the school policies that are in place right now. I would just like to point out one thing that I found really profound that one of the doctors who was an infectious disease the doc doctor said and that everybody is going to get COVID regardless of vaccination status or not. My question is, is what is the point of the protocols that we have in place if we have, if everybody is going to get COVID at one point or another? I recognize that it is contagious. I recognize that we've had students in this school district that have gotten it. Um, but I also want everybody to recognize we have not had one death of any child in our school district. Um, we don't do this for the flu. We don't do this for any other disease or virus out there. Um, so it leads me to believe what is the motive behind it? Is it about money? Is it about control? Is it about power or is it about fear? I'm willing to bet that it's probably about money and fear because it doesn't seem like it's about safety anymore. That is all. Thank you. Thank you. Maria Rodriguez. Those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty or safety. That's two different choices. I don't really like doing this. I much prefer a roundtable discussion or a healthy debate. I prefer public reprimand. I prefer private discussions. But I do believe that our freedoms are being methodically chipped away at. And I know too much about what socialism really is from someone who actually lived under it, who was a personal friend of mine, um, to sit by and say nothing. After all, as they say, silence is consent. We need to stop saying these things are for your safety, as AJ said earlier. Um, if that were true, cigarettes and alcohol would have been banned a long time ago. They cause half a million deaths, give or take, every year in our country. So what's it really about? Um, 
we sort of did a uh, thing where we, we decided in a group to, to speak on different things, and I, I got the dreaded mass conversation, and, and I've heard what the doctors have said, and, and you guys have all heard um, for the last couple of months what some of us or many of us think or feel about masks. So I did, decided not to give too much information about it, just a few. Um, a study from Vietnam, 2015, that was done to see the efficacy of cloth masks in preventing influenza-like illness. It was done with uh, six, 1,607 hospital workers. Uh, they were participants using the mask on shift for four consecutive weeks. The rates of all infection outcomes were highest in the cloth arm mask. Um, the infection rate was 95%. The conclusion of the study is that cloth masks not only allow viruses to get through, they actually, um, let's see, cloth mask pore filtration, they increase risk of infection. Most of our students wear cloth masks. That was a study done before there was a bias on masks that found conclusively the cloth mask did in fact increase risk of infection. So a group of parents from Florida decided to take their kids' masks to a lab to find out what exactly was growing on them in a day, in just a day. They took one mask, a brand new mask, took it to the lab after one day of wearing for their kid. Streptococcus pneumonia, myobacterium tuberculosis, meningitis, um, granulomatis, encephalitis, uh, pneumonia, E. coli, um, something called Borrelia burgdorferia, which causes Lyme disease, diphtheria, Legionnaire's disease, um, Steph Steptococcus, phylogene stereotype, so it causes severe infections and high morbidity rates, Staphylococcus, aureus, um, Those are the things that were found on the mask. So I, I do realize my time is up, but I do ask with AJ, What's your motivation? If you guys actually know these things, if you've heard these things, and tomorrow your kids come in and you say you have to wear a mask, what is the motivation? And my guess with AJ that it would be the three point five million dollar grant, the fear of losing that, and quite frankly, as we said in the beginning, those who would give up freedom for safety is on you. That's where we're at. Thank you. Good evening. I've been assured by Mr. Kais that CRT is not being taught here. I have the email if you want to see it. Uh, DEI, Diversity, Equality, Inclusion, is a framework being used to bring CRT into schools. DEI and CRT are two sides of the same coin. They are both based in cultural Marxism. I'm completely against racism. However, there is a concerted effort to inject this ideology and fundament fundamentally change, and I would say destroy, America purportedly to reduce racism. One of the end goals is to destroy capitalism. DEI training took place here this past week. I will read four quotes of prominent leaders and authors who've written on the, these ideologies. Quote, white identity is inherently racist. White people do not exist outside the system of white supremacy, unquote. Quote, the only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. The only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination, unquote. Quote, we believe that so long as the white race exists, all movements against what is called racism will fail. Therefore, our aim is to abolish the white race. Unquote. Quote, in order to truly be anti-racist, you have to be truly be anti-capitalist. And in order to be truly anti-capitalist, you have to be anti-racist because they're interrelated. Unquote. 
I can give you the authors of later if you want them. I don't want to waste my three minutes reading them today. I believe the Bible is sufficient to address the issues of life, including racism. The Bible condemns racism. The book of John says, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. The book of Romans says, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all. The book of James says, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin. DEI and CRT divides people into oppressors and oppressed, two groups, oppressors and the oppressed. The real oppressors are those rolling out this ideology, and those subjected to it, in this case, students and staff, are the real ones being oppressed. DEI and CRT is antithetical to what the Bible teaches. This ideology itself is racist and an attack on the very foundation of our country, including the U.S. Constitution. One cannot support this ideology while claiming to be defending the Constitution. This is happening on your watch. You are accountable for what is learned here. The superintendent employed by this district prior to Mr. Kais, Marty Cox, is a CRT proponent. He was ousted from his latest position by his school board less than a month ago. Neo-racist theories have no place in public education. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. would be appalled with the DEI CRT ideology. I'm going to provide you with a short five-page CRT briefing that I'd like copied and distributed to the board members. I will conclude with a short quote. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Joan Young. I have here the Code of Conduct book for the school, and I'd like to bring to your attention two items here before I read a little bit of this. Students may be subject to disciplinary action for A, 3, Using language or gestures that are profane, lewd, or vulgar, or abusive. And E, 12, using vulgar or abusive language, swearing, or cursing. It came to my attention <clears throat> that certain books were in your library that really shouldn't be part of the curriculum, um, whether it's for personal curriculum or for school curriculum or part of a reading list, I see no benefit to this language. For the sake of everyone present, I will not say the uh, swear word, but instead I will say, he wanted to F her tenderly, but the tenderness would not hold. The tightness in her vagina was more than he could bear. His soul seemed to slip down to his guts and fly out into her, and that gigantic thrust he made into her then provoked the only sound she made, a hollow suck of air in the back of her throat, like the rapid loss of air from a surface blow. Following this disintegration, the falling away of sexual desire, he was conscious of her wet, silky hands on his wrists, the finger clenching, but whether her grip was from hopeless or stubborn struggle to be free, or from some other emotion, he could not tell. Removing himself from her was so painful that he cut himself short and snatched his genitals out of her dry harbor of, his, of her vagina. She appeared to have fainted. Kali, Chali stood up and could only see her grayish panties, so sad and limp around her ankles. Again, the hatred mixed with tenderness. The hatred would not let him pick her up. The tenderness forced him to cover her. So when the child regained consciousness, 
She was lying on the kitchen floor under a heavy quilt, trying to connect the pain between her legs to the face of her mother looming over her. This, my friends, is a story of a young girl and Charlie who raped her was her father. This book has incest in it, rape. Inappropriate sexual conduct. It has swear words in it. It has no place in our school. And that's it. I would like to just know why is this kind of reading material acceptable when in your bylaws, language, gestures that are profane, lewd, vulgar, or abusive isn't allowed. So why is it allowed to read? to be part of the curriculum. That's it. Thank you. I do apologize. I did um, skim over Rosemary Norris. I apologize for that. Are you, would you like to speak now? I can, I can I'm sorry? You can pass? Okay. Um, on to Kevin Young. I apologize. I come from a family who takes culture very seriously. <clears throat> My father was a Cornell graduate in agriculture, and eventually he went on to become a United Methodist pastor. So he had in all total three degrees. At some point, he decided to put together as much funding as he could and bought modern farm equipment and went over to Africa to teach modern farming. Unfortunately, the common term, which was Marxist back, was terrorizing Africa starting in the 1950s, actually a little before that, and killed one of my father's best friends, who was simply a bush pilot, who delivered medicine and food to Harvard Genetic. A similar uh, situation with uh, Marxist-backed interests was when I was a kid, I got piano lessons from a professor of Eugene, who at one point in his life, when the Soviet Union took half of Poland and the Nazis took the other half, both of those factions took people, teachers like yourself, out into a field, and the politicians too, by the way, they wouldn't go along with them, and machine gunned them all. Professor Buchanan was running alongside his brother because once they saw the machine guns, they knew what was going to happen, they ran to the back. Professor Buchanan made it into the woods. His brother went down next to him and ran. No such luck. Marxism has no good thing at any level. It never was any good at doing anything other than <coughs> other than leading by uh, terror or suppressing freedom. Take a look at Cuba. The people are rioting in the streets to try to just have freedom. The kind that the United States has always. I take seriously that critical race theory to boil code Marxism. I've been reading up on it for several weeks now, and in three minutes, I can't tell you how it involves all these different aspects of what is being taught in many of the schools today. But I can tell you, if you want to do your research, it's out there. If you want to find more information of using very cogent titles. We owe our children a future without a 
government that stands over it and dictates and micromanages it. So as we look at committee reports, um, Nelson had said, um, you know, last month we had had the evaluation proposal uh, for the energy performance contract. And uh, does anyone have any questions about it or any thoughts that they wanted to share? You know, it's so you know, we, we had about it and uh, you know, I had a chance to hear from, you know, from the, you know, from the, uh, the organizer there. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, you know, some of the some of these committee members, if you might, you know, feel comfortable just kind of sharing your thoughts. Um, um, yeah, I, I don't think many of us were. Uh, we don't know a lot about the numbers. Uh, one of the uh, things I think one of the notice was that the proposal that we do almost the compromise at all. And it seems that the both of these are not keeping the hand on the house. Unfortunately, we lost one of the proposals, and we had gone and then did talk. Maybe some of the benefit is that I could tell it to the next person to get on the fuel and pay it. Ryan's point is didn't seem to customize the portfolio very well. Their average project cost was around nine million dollars, and what they drafted for us was about two. So we just sort of scaled it. You could tell that it was something that was catered towards the two million or smaller district. And like Ryan said, a lot of the things on the proposal was just very manageable for us where it felt we didn't have to pay to our savings for someone else to do it when we could do it ourselves. Okay, I appreciate that feedback. I'll let you go. Okay. We're having a very difficult time here. If you guys can either speak up or get close to me. <laughs> I'll just repeat most of mine again. I don't know how much I'll remember. But the general um, gist of what I said, we had a project laid out to us, proposed that we could use money we save to pay another company to do facility upgrades. And their average project throughout the state were normally around the scale of $9 million. For ours, it was about $2 million. And the proposals they gave us seemed like they weren't customized for us. They were pretty much cookie cutter for other larger districts. So it didn't make sense for us to spend the money and then use the money we're saving in the long run pay them when it seemed like some of the upgrades we could manage ourselves. So for the facilities meeting, the general consensus was we wouldn't have to pay another company for these facility upgrades that we could handle ourselves. Yeah, I can agree with that. Okay. So I just wanted to just confirm then that, that based on the facilities committee meeting, one of the most lost Patients that uh, um, that it sounds like everybody's in agreement that we will pass on, on the DPC and then um, what I'll do then is I'll just talk to them and let them know. You know, obviously, you know, thank them for their, for their time and what. But I agree, both of the proposals there was there was there was good and bad in each of them. And if we could have customized it, I think it would have it would have been much more attractive to us. But uh, unfortunately, it wasn't. So thank you. Okay. Um, so now we need a motion to approve consensus motion number one. All in favor? Okay. And then we need a motion to approve consensus motion number two. All right. All, all, all in favor? All right. 
Um, Archie, did anyone else sign up for public participation for a second session? Is that okay. everybody? Okay. So now I need a motion for consensus motion number three. All right, all in favor? And then lastly, I need a motion to go into our anticipated executive session to discuss the position of a particular person. I need a motion to go into motion. All in favor? Okay. When we come out of our executive session, we will very briefly set an agenda for the next meeting and then adjourn. Thank you.